So the first question that this title kind of begs is, when I say marketing your tech talent, what tech talent am I talking about and who's doing the marketing? In other words, to whom is this talk addressed? So I'd say uh, it is both the individual technologists, those of you who are out there freelancing, who are marketing yourselves, who have startups, who are with other small companies. Probably a lot of the people who really need to hear this talk may never listen to it because they are the people in big marketing, like big corporations and so on. I have occasionally had a marketing title to me. It's never been a good fit, but I keep doing what I do and hope that someday people will understand it. Um, by technologists, I should say, I mean software engineers, sysadmins, DevOps, support teams, basically all the people who are creating, using, and running technology and know how it works. And that is any technology. I don't care you know, whether you're running databases or running websites or writing kernel operating systems. I'm talking to you if you really, really know technology, which I will be the first to admit is more than I do for most areas. I'm assuming that the audience we're talking about marketing to here is also technologists. And I hope that by the end of this, you'll have some ideas on why we need to market tech talent, some new ideas on how to do it, and understand how it's to the mutual advantage of buyer and seller to do it well. One caveat I will make here is I am not talking about spinning straw into gold. I'm not talking about taking marketing VPs and making them tech conference stars. I'm talking about actual talent. <laughs> so the agenda is a brief and extremely personal view of technology marketing. You'll see as I go along, I've had a somewhat weird history with tech. Uh, this leads to a few reasons why I think you should market technologists and how I do it. So, history. This is from Byte Magazine in 1993. As you can see, at the time, technology marketing, as practiced by marketing professionals, looked pretty much like the marketing for anything else. I mean, this could be Tide detergent. It was glossy brochures, magazine ads, product data sheets, all written in that professional tone of voice. <laughs> uh, yes, betraying my prejudices there. <clears throat> uh, it was aimed at corporate decision makers or consumers most of whom were actually not expected to be that technologically savvy. With the advent of the World Wide Web, which was happening right around this time, not much actually changed, not immediately. So by way of example, in, 19, in the early 90s, I was working for a company called InCat Systems, which is a small Italian startup, very unusual for Italy. We got bought by Adaptech in 1995. I had already been working closely with the engineers on UI. I wrote all the documentation. But I had also for some time been interacting with customers online. I actually had a CompuServe forum in the early 90s that CompuServe invited me to run. And I was out on the Usenet doing things like this. Because of all this, plus I kind of co-authored a book about CD recording, I was well known online as the person to talk to about CD recording. And there was a part of me that always felt that this was unfair because I had not written a line of the code and the guys who actually made this possible were not getting the glory. So I had this idea in the back of my head sometime around early 96, it's like, well, let's introduce these engineers to the public. Let's tell people who the people are behind the software that they use and love. I happened to make the mistake of mentioning this to an executive. <laughs> this was squashed very immediately and very hard. We do not ever mention the names of engineers on any public forum. Okay. Why wouldn't you? because they'll get headhunted. And this was typical at the time. Engineers were already a very hot commodity, of course, by then, and we were trying to keep them in the basement where no one could find them. And this is why engineers used to put Easter eggs in software. I don't know if any of you have been in the business long enough to have done this, where you hid your name in your software somewhere because that was the only way to get it out there. So then in 1999, we all got run over by the clue train which interestingly, I first heard about from a customer who said, I think you're a great example of the clue train in action. Okay, that's nice, and then I went and read the book. So markets were getting smarter, as the clue train manifestos told us, so were employees. Technologists began to realize that their employees were rarely loyal to them, and there was no particular reason for them to be loyal to most of their employers. 
Sun Microsystems may have been the last tech company that really commended or deserved a lot of employee loyalty, at least as far as the technology side went. The dot-com crash of 2001 just made this all painfully clear. If you weren't an essential employee and that was being pretty narrowly defined, you were gone. It was all about corporate profit and corporate profit wasn't happening anymore. In the meantime, the open source movement was beginning to show us that there might be new ways of doing the software business. So, I'd like to take you aside for a moment and look at a completely different industry. For decades now, the model for physical production and post-production of films is that most of the people involved are freelancers, brought together for the duration of a project, which is to say a film. In film, the term talent is used for actors and directors, people who make box, people who are going to bring people into the theater buying tickets. Production teams are hired for their skills, such as knowing some particular editing software. Uh, now, I know that there are certain houses for whom that is not true, like Pixar, their engineers stay in-house and invent new things there. But by and large, in the film industry, a team comes together, works on a project for up to several years, and then they disperse to other projects. I think in the last 15 years in software, we are seeing sorry, a similar model happening a similar model of employment. And if you think about startups and the fact that so many startups are spun up quickly, get aqua hired, and you know, somebody makes some money, but basically that project is out the door and the talent all goes on to something new. So if you think about it, this has implications for how and why we should market our talents. So now we get to the whys. One of the implications of the Hollywood model is the top talents, if you are one of these top talents, you don't need a company nearly as much as that company needs you. And that's not just in terms of your coding skills, but also your reputation. While it may seem counterproductive, this is precisely why the companies need to market you. So here's my, my bullet points on the why. There could be many more. So it's the concept of box office. There are people who will drive interest in a company because they already have a name. It's to get quality tech content, and I will go into that in much more depth. It's to attract, develop, and retain talent, and it's for the typical marketing stuff. Name, leads, SEO. So how's this for box office? This is actually what they would call in India a hoarding. In other words, a billboard. This is in Hyderabad, India. It, I took the picture in March of 2010 at what was essentially the last of the Sun Tech Days, which by then had been rebranded Oracle. So I was surprised and delighted to see an entire gigantic billboard on a major traffic interchange with James Gosling on it. Gosling was an early example of how Sun actively marketed its technologists, creating, it didn't create the rock stars, but Sun may have been the first company to use that term in relation to technologists. So these people became recognized by others, both within and without their industry, and especially, of course, by customers. In the case of people like Gosling, they literally had box office appeal. I never got to attend the, these particular ones, but I'm told that when Gosling used to do his toy shows at Community One, he would pack Moscone's main conference hall, which I'm sure some of you have been there, and you know it's very large. Um, I did manage to inherit one of his robots, two of them, actually. But box office appeal in this context means that customers will be aware of your project because of the names associated with it. Uh, and, you know, they know that some of their favorite technologists are working on it. Like when you think about how many times when somebody leaves a company, you see these nostalgic articles about, you know, so-and-so did these wonderful things with this, this company, and we all look forward to seeing what they do next. And it's true that you then follow that person. You hear that they've gone to some new company, and you say, well, so-and-so's gone there. Let's see what's happening over there and you might not have looked at that company before. In some cases, customers can expect to benefit directly from the presence of a tech star in a particular company. We have Brendan Gregg working for Joyent, and for a company that sells itself on performance, as you can imagine, some of our biggest customers are thrilled to think that they're gonna have Brendan Gregg looking at their performance problems. So quality content. I could go on about this for hours. I frequently have in marketing meetings. Um, it is really very simple. If you're trying to create technical content, 
leave it to the people who know the technology. Don't hire it out to third-party writers, even if they tell you that they worked for Sun and they know Sun's technologies. Don't leave it to the marketing team who may know, hopefully know something about the technology, but undoubtedly do not know it in the depth that the people who are actually making the technology know it. Among other things, from the marketing point of view, this stretches your marketing dollar. You're going to get great content a lot more cheaply than if you hire somebody to write a $10,000 white paper, which your engineers then have to review anyway because it was half wrong. It's very possible that your techies have already created great content, but it's hidden in a bug database, an email thread, or source code comments. So you may have to know to ask them or to go and look for it. One thing to talk to your techies about is what is stopping them from getting this great content out there? Is it just that they hate your blogging platform? So find out how you can help and go fix it. When you have a technologist who blogs well or in other ways communicates well, that person is gold to your company. Brendan is my go-to for examples on just about everything, as this is his personal blog, which got moved, or it's one of his three personal blogs, it got moved from sun.com to dstrace.org when half the Fishworks team left, left Sun. And this is his traffic for year to date this year, uh, and doesn't do justice to a couple of big spikes he's had in the last few years. So he is someone who can easily drive traffic you know, he gets on Hacker News, stuff comes back up, pops to the surface, and is reproposed by people all over the world. And that adds some luster to Joanne's name, as well as he's got a Joanne banner on his homepage. So people are reading Brendan, you know, at least out of the corner of their eye, they're seeing Joanne. Um, and it's at no cost to you. All you have to do is let them do it for some of them. I, some of you may have seen on Twitter, I was running a little survey in the last few weeks trying to get an idea of what is important to technologists in communicating about what they do. And I was surprised to find that out of the grand total of 58 respondents I got, a few of them actually are still forbidden by their employers from blogging or writing or whatever about what they do. And that is just wasted opportunity. This is like you're being a film producer and you're telling Brad Pitt not to do interviews about the new movie he's in. So another reason to help your techies market is because it helps you attract, develop, and retain great talent. When somebody knows that a rock star like Brian Cantrell has gone to Joint, other people will follow because they've heard about Brian Cantrell and they want to work with him and the rest of the team. Uh, in this picture, we have some of the original Fishworks team as they were gathered a couple of weeks ago for a reunion. Uh, I've been running every, every year during Open World, I run the Solaris family reunion. And so we have some, a good deal of the original Fishworks team. Adam Leventhal is now CTO of Delphix. And half of the important ZFS developers followed him to Delphix. So the fact that you're out there, that people know you're there, and that you're hiring, it's going to help. The kinds of marketing techniques I'll be talking about shortly all have the intended effect of helping to develop the tech ta talent that you have in-house. You might have a junior person who's never spoken at a conference before. You encourage them to do it, you help them do it, and that is developing their talents in turn in areas outside of strict coding. For them, that's career development, and most of them are very happy to have that help. Obviously, all of this leads to retention. You've got talented people who know they're working with talented people that they're going to learn from. They feel like they're developing in many areas of their own careers. That's a recipe for retention. So here's just one example of the marketing side of it, of how you can use tech marketing to widen your funnel. This, uh, is, a, this is the Google result for Linux performance. Um, I just snipped the one here because the, the actual ranking goes up and down between 5 and 10. What happened was, uh, two years ago, the organizers of the Southern California Area Linux Expo asked me to help provide speakers on SmartOS and Illumos. And they said, yeah, don't worry. I know it says Linux in the title, but we actually want to hear about these other operating systems. So we took three people down there to speak in 2012. In 2013, Brendan Gregg did a talk which packed a room on Linux performance analysis and tools. This thing has had like 150,000 views on SlideShare. Um, what I did was hurry up and get, I actually personally videoed that, took the tape back home, edited it, got it out within the week. 
And then that weekend, Brenton and I were just kind of irritated because other people were talking about things in our space. And so we did a guerrilla marketing campaign on Twitter, got the thing on Hacker News. It ran on Hacker News all day. And as a result, it has been one of the top five to 10 results for the keyword Linux performance ever since, which is deeply ironic when you consider that Joyant's claim to fame is that it's a cloud company that's not based on Linux. Um, yes, we get, I gave this to marketing as a blog post with the video embedded, and it has been the 12th most popular page on Joyant since March. So, before I run out of voice, let's talk about some how. So how specifically do you market your tech talent, get them to essentially getting your techies to do your company's technology marketing? We all know we have a lot of media available to us now. This is an example from Sun. Linda Scrocky was the person who ran the Sun blogging platform. And this is a slide from a talk that she did in early 2009 with then current statistics on Sun blogs. I'm sure all of you know that Jonathan Schwartz was the famous CEO blogger who did some quite innovative things with corporate blogs, which later became a point of contention in a lawsuit. Um, Blogging, I would say, is still an ideal format for technologists, partly because text is still the best way to share code and screen output. That's just not going to work very well on video, and it also makes it highly searchable, which leads to that magic SEO that marketers love to have. So how can you actually encourage people to blog? I was actually hired to encourage content to happen by Sun in 2007, and so I did things like run blogging contests. It's extremely cheesy. I had a t-shirt made up that says, I'm blogging this for Sun. And I would give it to people, I would send it to them uh, in rich when they got a certain percentage increase on the traffic to their blog month on month, uh, which mean meant I had to exclude certain people like Schwartz. <laughs> uh -huh. But uh, one result of this was that Brendan came to my attention because his blog went ballistic when they did that famous video of him shouting at a JBOD. Um, so, yes, that is still famous, and that has had close to a million views now on YouTube. Um, so you can help them by encouraging them by, you know, I used to just do a lot of statistics work, seeing which blogs were out there that were more abundant, which had posts that were still popular that maybe their authors had kind of forgotten about, um, you know, maybe suggest an update, maybe. There's a lot of little stuff you can do, and it, it worked to an extent. Um, and this stuff particularly works well in a large company where you've got a lot of people who are, in a sense, competing with each other for company attention. My name is strongly associated with video. I started filming for Sun in 2007 with about 18 presentations at a SNEA conference. Um, so you can find my channel on YouTube in which I have regathered things from archives over the years that I've been doing this. I've now got about 500 technology videos on there. Um, a lot of them is just capturing video at events like this, but it can also be I've done informal things where I've just, it's like, you know, hey, I happen to have the top three performance guys at Sun, happen to be in San Francisco at the t this week from the s different parts of the world, let's get them all in front of the camera and have, just let them talk. And, you know, so it's, it's, it's ad hoc and the quality, as you'll see if you go to my YouTube account, is often very rough. But as long as you can hear it decently, people are fine with that. It may even, to an extent, be an advantage not to have it be too slick and polished, because as technologists, we tend to be suspicious of stuff that looks too slick and markety. Um, so cheap, fast, get it done, get it out there, and you may be surprised at how long a lifespan some of this stuff has. I would add that video is not always people's favorite way to receive information. I said for some things like code and screen output, and it's just some people's learning styles. To some extent, it may be a generational thing. Some people just deeply prefer text. So if you can possibly afford it, do transcriptions and try to develop stuff into text as well. Also, at, at Sun, I had money for a while, so I used to do things like get my videos professionally subtitled, you know, both in English and then translate those into other languages. Uh, just because a lot of my market was not native English speakers and it's much harder for them to understand spoken word than written word. So whatever you can afford to do to help build your market is going to help. 
One point that um, Brendan came up with a few years ago was that from his point of view, as somebody who does a lot of content in a lot of different ways, video for him is extremely efficient because all he has to do is sit in front of a camera and talk or deliver a presentation that he was going to prepare and deliver anyway. And then I'm doing the work of actually editing, posting, and so forth. So that is the most efficient of his investment of his time to get material out. Uh, you know, obviously, then you need to have someone like me around who will do that. Uh, and Brendan runs the spectrum all the way up to writing very large books, which take 2,000 hours over the course of a year or 18 months. So he knows what he's talking about. A, from the marketer's point of view, a quick and easy way to get great content is to send people to speak at conferences. Um, also from the marketer's point of view, if you think about you know, you, we know that there are conferences where you can pay a million dollars and do a keynote. We also know as the paying... Uh, we appreciate <laughs> <laughs> we'll have a, I'll tell you what actually happened on that one. Um, but, uh, <clears throat> Oracle. Um, <laughs> and we also know that as paying attendees, when we pay to go to these things, how we feel about those sponsored keynotes. Can I, can I get any uh, thumbs down here? Um, so if you think about it from the company's point of view, what is it worth to you in terms of your marketing budget to have an employee who is actually invited or accepted to speak at a conference without paying for it? You know, it's a huge vote of confidence in your company's technical acumen. And usually, you know, if you, we've all been to the conferences, we've seen that those are the talks that tend to be the best attended and the most inspiring to the attendees, not the paid keynotes. So it really pays off to help your employees attend conferences. In some cases, that's persuading, getting them past imposter syndrome and persuading them that they actually have expertise that the world wants to hear about. You know, particularly with some of our younger engineers at Joyent, I've had to prod them a little and say, you know, actually, you're good, and people want to hear this. And so it might be their first time out at a conference, but you know, I haven't had anybody let me down yet. Uh, and it can be very... You know, concrete stuff like tracking deadlines, helping them with you know, submissions, uh, abstracts, and talk titles, and so on. You know, what's going to make a punchy title that people will come and listen to? Uh, and also, you can give them a chance to practice by running smaller meetups that they can go speak at. So that is something else I've been doing a fair amount of. Um, you know, I used to do this for Sun when I was on the Open Solaris community team. We ran some very targeted events like the um, Open Storage Summit. And for Joyent, I've done D-Trace Conference, ZFS Day, Illumos Day. Um, the, thing I would, the takeaway here is keep them cheap, keep them friendly, keep them technology-centric. Do not treat this as marketing lead gen. This is much more about evangelism and relationship building. And it's a chance to facilitate that conversation among technologists. And events are a great way to generate a lot of video in a hurry. My rule of thumb is, if it didn't get filmed, it didn't happen. Uh, I've also spoiled my audience now because they assume that I'm going to stream everything. And I generally do. So um, I'm surprised that sometimes people will log into a stream from halfway across the world where it's 2 in the morning, and they will actually stay glued to this thing for a couple of hours. So don't underestimate the willingness and desire of people to participate live, even remotely. I'm not going to say too much about this because so much has been said about it by people who know far better than I do. But for completeness sake, open sourcing software is obviously a very important way for technologists to market themselves. They share what they do, not just the binaries, but the actual lines of code. Their peers can see what they do, build on it, share it, enjoy it, use it. Your repository is your resume. So again, the companies that for whatever reason don't allow their employees to share code are missing the boat on a lot of things. And you know, there, there are beginning to be technologists who just won't work on anything that isn't open source. And there's a lot of good reasons for that. Uh, not least of which is that they can take their products with them when they move on. I know a lot of people who would be very unhappy in their current jobs if they couldn't use Dtrace. Community is all part of that. Encourage people to be active members of a relevant community. Support that to the extent that you can even if it's not a community that you own. But anything you can do to get technologists talking to each other is important. 
One caveat, though, though, is if you do own the community in any sense, be very, very careful about how you use that for marketing because you can turn off a community in a hurry by suddenly making it very clear and, oh, by the way, we own that. Something, uh, this doesn't come up too often, but if your tech talent has invented or developed something that's worth writing a book or an article about, do all that you can to encourage that and help it because a book in the end is a great marketing tool. If you think Brendan Gregg has written, he's published the Dtrace book and the Systems Performance book is about to be published. Both of those are about this thick. You send that to somebody that's sitting on their bookshelf, people think about it because they feel guilty that they haven't read it yet. <laughs> and it's gonna sit there on their desk every day reminding them. Uh, so it well, gets- it actually get read or is it just gonna sit there and inspire It does get read as well. But I've been, uh, I've been persuading our marketing people that they don't want to give away electronic copies. They want to give away paper because electronic, it's easy to forget that you own it because it's sitting on your device somewhere, whereas paper, it's going to sit there. Uh, and encouraging and helping in this case means I have actually edited both of these books, and it was a hell of a lot of work. Uh, but Twitter, I just, again, for completeness, I can't leave it out. It's not that useful as a, as a medium for communicating technology directly, but of course it's extremely useful for steering the audience to content and for having a conversation around technology content. Again, for completeness, white papers, does anybody care anymore? They have such a bad reputation as containing marketing fluff and being behind a login wall so that marketing can get that lead generation. If you have really good technical content that you want to share, put it in a blog post and leave it open to the world to read without giving their names up. So a little bit more quickly on that survey that I ran. I asked people what media they are currently using to communicate about technology. And these are the results I got, ordered by order of importance. It's interesting that so few said video when in fact most of them, if they're speaking at conferences, probably are getting videoed. They may have thought I meant something else. And then I, I tried to get at, if you see being able to communicate about what you do as a work benefit, what is it worth to you? I don't think people understood the monetization question, so I would like to figure out a better way to run that. But just in terms of, you know, on a scale of I don't care at all to I can't live without it, this was the result. Um, so again, that's interesting. Again, video comes out in a slightly strange place there from, from my point of view, but um, this is something we can keep in mind as we are trying to employ technologists or we wish to be employed as technologists is if I go to work for a company which does not allow me to communicate about what I do, what is that, what am I giving up? And there are some companies that still don't. A few do's and don'ts. Going back to the Clue Train Manifesto, markets are conversations, remember. It's about the conversation between technologists, not the conversation between marketing and customers. So you can use everything I've mentioned to facilitate that conversation with a few caveats. Don't try to keep people to an editorial calendar. Forget it, it won't work. Do not try to put them on a dev blog that looks exactly like the marketing pages because they will go off and create their own blog and put their stuff there without any branding whatsoever. Uh, you know, there's some companies that do this really well, like Etsy and so on, that have a separate developer engineering blog, and that may be the best approach. There may be a halfway point, but um, just keep that in mind. And do not attempt to control the message or the tone. Speaking of tone, those first few points are for you guys who might be doing this sort of communication. The note to the execs is, yes, that often will include a beer and the word fuck. Get over it. I have steadfastly refused to bleep Brian Cantrell. <laughs> and again, it's about, as a marketer, it's about facilitating the conversation and getting out of the way. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I, yeah, I think I've actually found someone who talks faster than him, but I can't remember who it is right now. <laughs> so there's a few unanswered questions here. Is I've been doing all of this stuff in and around my actual job titles for six or seven years now. I still don't know what to call it, and I tend to get stuck in situations where people vaguely agree that this stuff is worth doing, 
but they don't know who owns it, and at some point sa someone says, yeah, but you really need to be doing X. You know, that's, you know, yeah, your videos are nice, go write white papers. Um, and, you know, I actually quit Oracle partly over that sort of attitude, among many other reasons. Different organizations have different answers to these questions, and these, the answers change over time. Like my former colleague, Rick Ramsey, who used to run Big Admin for Sun and is now with OTN at Oracle, he's been in several different parts of both Sun and Oracle. You know, engineering, corporate marketing. You know, again, they can't quite figure out what to do with you. If you're lucky, they'll continue to agree that what you're doing is important, but that's not always guaranteed. So people like Rick and I, we don't know what to call it either. But we recognize that it's important and we keep on doing it even though we get very tired of explaining it to management. So perhaps someday we will find a way to get this recognized behind an actual title like, I don't know, off the top of my head I was coming up with Technology Talent Manager. <laughs> so I've got, aside from you all for listening to me, thank you, uh, a couple of people who had input into this. And there's a few resources. I have actually blogged a few disparate pieces about things like why film engineers, and you can go and look those up. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>